We don't expect much of these children. They are, after all, an experiment. The headmaster of Bramcote Hills Grammar School is welcoming the parents of the 13 plus children. My dad is livid. On that day in 1961, he hands me a script. Get on and make me proud. My father had been quietly trained to beam with pride when his friends struggled to distinguish my accent from that of a white person over the phone. Trained to remove himself from the house when my mother's friends and colleagues came round to socialise. Just as his mother had taught him to make himself scarce for the white family whose house she worked in as a maid. And where he would have to sneak through the garden fence for any chance of a mothering moment. He had been socialised to think that he would have nothing to add or contribute to the conversation, little of value to pass down to me. Will you stay for a bit of lunch, love? My sister asks, offering just a salad sandwich, white sliced bread and butter, holding lettuce, tomatoes and cucumber laced with salad cream. I have not tasted its like for years. It's delicious and comforting. It's a coming home to an imagined place that no longer exists. During the referendum campaign, the conversation in the staff room of the supermarket I'd worked in for four years was dominated by Brexit and primarily centered around immigration. I was usually greeted with one of two contradictory responses, something to the effect of, but you work, indicating that I was not a threat to the nation's resources by relying on public funds like the so-called maligned benefits tourists or, but you're not really foreign, delivered with affection and the intention of making me aware that they thought I belonged in England, but it had a profoundly alienating effect. During the time of being an elected mute, I listened to how language was formed, learned to understand what words outside of my mother tongue meant. I still remember the fear I had when challenged to speak properly. Now, when I drop an A and replace it with an H, I no longer feel the pang of shame. Here I am today, a poet, skilled at performance. I pay homage to the little girl that I was back then, afraid to speak, unaware of how my future would unfold. Walking down the steps, I imagined the voices held in the documents talking to me, clamouring for attention in this part of the Bodleian Library that holds thousands and thousands of witnesses giving evidence at Parliament sessions, telling their stories. In here, commissioners and inspectors of factories reported on the amount of labour working class women did. But in here too were the women's own voices. The vote is important, but what is more important to us is our work. And this is what we fight for, our wages support, our families. I found this is where both the interest and the power of 19th century working class women revealed itself. But included in the agonizing detail of the testimonies of these 19th century working class women is a warning of the challenges middle class feminists posed to them and to those who came after them, women like me. This panel presentation explores the production of the classed, gendered and racialised subject with stories of transitions through family relationships, education, friendships and work. It illustrates the huge potential of autoethnography as research method, mode of inquiry and creative practice to illuminate the specificities and commonalities of our experiences and to sound a call to action against inequality and discrimination. Despite its commitment to a social justice agenda, it seems to me that class is largely missing from autoethnographic accounts at present, and that this is the case across a variety of disciplinary traditions, including those of contributors to the Clever Girls collection, which includes history, psychology, counselling, English, communication studies, and drama. 
even within education, an abiding and powerful public narrative of social mobility persists. The notion of social mobility sees education as a positional good, something that offers a gateway for children to achieving at least equal and preferably higher status in terms of occupation and living standards than their parents. But it leaves unanswered a number of very important questions. At the social and political level, it begs the question of who doesn't get access. At the cultural level, it tends to ignore what gets left behind. And at the individual personal level, it doesn't ask questions about what the costs as well as the gains might be of the transitions involved. It doesn't accommodate liminality, that experience of ambiguity and disorientation that occurs in the middle stage of a rite of passage in a journey that the sum never quite feels completed, leaving many feeling in between in one way or another. The collection explores lived experiences of a diversity of such journeys of becoming, as told by clever girls, women who had the potential from girlhood to achieve the kind of success that social mobility promises, especially for those like us who came from what is referred to rather tellingly as non-traditional backgrounds. Themes of voice and silence feature prominently in our stories, both literally and metaphorically. There is how one sounds, pressures on black and mixed heritage girls to forget their mother tongue, to speak uppity proper English, or experiencing the misrecognition of low expectations, pressures on white girls and women to lose their regional accents, or risk as late as the 80s being seen by middle-class students as not fit to be teaching them. The puzzling phenomenon for a little Indian girl of hearing Moira Stewart and Krishnan Gurumurthy on the telly sounding unnaturally posh. The unsettling experience for a Canadian of being accepted as a not really foreign immigrant due to her accent, nationality and ethnicity. Then there is being silenced, experiences of elective mutism, stuttering, panic at what being asked to read aloud in an English class symbolises. The silence from colleagues that greets the speaking of painful truths in professional settings. Or when articulation is so inaccessible that pain is written on the body. Finally, there is the all-pervasive silencing of never feeling quite entitled to speak. In the space between the covers of a book, and now here in the space of a virtual conference room, some clever girls are reclaiming their voices. First, Nell Farrell reads a poem from her chapter, Common Ground. It was at football matches with her dad that Nell found a place of cultural belonging. In her chapter, she cites an observation from Lindsay Hanley's book, Respectable, that class migration can turn us into a binary sort of person who is prim and proper in a rough environment and coarse and chaotic in a posh one. For me, Nell says, just as for my dad, football can offer a space where that uncomfortable binariness disappears. She left football supporting when she left Eastwood, the town in Nottinghamshire where she was born, but came home to it years later. Grounded. Words I hadn't used in 20 years, still fluent as a mother tongue. Goal hanging, nutmegged, offside trap, turn on a sixpence, one, two, a great first touch. Aged nine, in duffel coat and new club scarf, I strode off to the main gate to sell programmes, Suze's marchers crackling on the tannoy. In the tea bar, women emptied catering packs of coffee and clouds of fine dried milk into a giant urn where they were stirred and alchemised until by kickoff there was milky coffee in a sturdy sky blue cup. Mushy peas were labelled into polystyrene pots and doused with mint sauce, decanted from cash and carry jars too big for me to even lift. At half time, I ruled the sweet display. Three shelved, glass fronted, 
handing over wagon wheels and Mars bars, demanding money proudly on the strength of my own maths. Out on the touchline for the 90 minutes, the men in overcoats, the hopeful boys, three players' wives, our fullbacks' mum and I screamed out, man on! And all believed that in a ground so small we were of help. Eleven years of Saturdays, hands freezing, heart bouncing round those chalked out lines and semicircles, a template for elation and despair, indelible as poetry or catechism. Now we have Crystal Welsh. I am a participant at an interdisciplinary conference whose aims are to examine how trauma is carried from one generation to the next and to assess the potential for psychotherapeutic interventions to heal the intergenerational trauma experienced by individuals and communities. The presenter at this professional knowledge workshop is a white male. He asks each of us to state our research topic and share what we know about our subjects. As each participant talks and the presenter comments, we all listen and feel encouraged by each other. There is a sense of comradeship and a respect for what each person is trying to achieve. But I still relate particularly to one particip participant's topic, shame. I'm aware that I have already internalized the symptoms of the wretched black woman. I experience the physical sensations of shame as I prepare to present what I know of my subject to a group comprised of predominantly white middle-class women. The two men there stand out as does the other black woman. I struggle with the desire to remain silent for fear of being ignored, but I share what I know of my subject, African Caribbean women and trauma. It feels to me as though the air has been sucked out of the room to be replaced by an oppressive silence. You can hear a pin drop. I have come to expect the silence. But here within this group of therapists, I had believed we were, all, we were willing to endure the psychological and intellectual demands of each other's subjects. I had hoped we would be able to bring at least the same professional empathy we offer our clients. To these experiences of African Caribbean women. It seems to me, however, that even for this group, the African Caribbean woman unconsciously represents the age old black problem, the unclassed, the ugly baby. I feel like someone who has come along and spoiled their party. There is a long pause. Out of the silence without any acknowledgement of my presentation from anyone, a white female participant starts to present. I'm in a double bind. I am faced with taking responsibility for interpret interrupting this person mid sentence by asking for the same feedback others have received from a reluctant group or remaining silent yet again. Through being at the receiving end of silence in the past, I have been left feeling traumatized, ignored, gagged and enraged at being unable to fully express intellectually what I had experienced and also with a nagging feeling that it was my own fault for needing to be acknowledged and affirmed by a white community that dehumanizes me. Motivated by shame 
and wanting to quickly integrate back into the group. I have previously colluded with the silencing, even initiating, changing the subject. So entrenched has my internalized oppression become. Now I'm obliged to postponify the angry black woman by choosing to speak. I speak. Required to give feedback, the presenter acknowledges the over-representation of African Caribbean people in the mental health service. He also acknowledges that he knows nothing of my subject. I am reminded that the experiences of Afro-Caribbean people in general and Afro-Caribbean women in particular take white professionals to a place of unknowing. In such a context, it would not be surprising if the previously unexamined and now unwanted rage arising in white participants from this uncomfortable place were projected onto black participants. Often in these situations, I find myself struggling not to manifest feelings of rage, resulting from the overwhelming emotions arising from having been ignored, shut down and shamed. This time, I force myself to stay in an environment where I am feeling vulnerable and physically sick. And now Jan Bradford, who wrote about where we come from, what we inherit in the form of family scripts, and what we pass down. You come from a long line of strong women. Tonkins tells us that we live in other people's pasts, whether we know it or not. Mum likes to tell me stories about our past as I am growing up. Oh, you're a lucky wee girl, Jan. You've got so many opportunities I never had. We struggled just to make ends meet. There was plenty of love and always food on the table, but it was a hard life. Your ma and dad didn't have two hapneys to rub together when I was growing up. You don't know you're born these days with all the opportunities you've been given. Just make sure you use them. But always remember where you came from, mind. That's important. And you're a lucky wee girl because you come from good stock. And then there is a pause before the inevitable punchline that I have come over the years to recognise as the family story that establishes me as who I am, who I have always been and who I will always be expected to be. Yes, Mum continues sagely, mind and always remember that you come from a long line of strong women. Four generations of women feature in this long line of strong women. Me, Mum, Mum's mum, my Nana, and Nana's mum, our Ma. Each of us in this long line were birthed at home into the arms of a close-knit, declining mining community. Each of us was named and christened Janet. But each of us was also given their own pet name. I am Jan, Mum is Jeanette, Nana is Janet, and Ma is Nettie. And each of us has also gifted the maiden names of our maternal grandmother and great-grandmother's middle names. At school, other girls have sensible middle names like Catherine or Margaret, whilst I have two silly sounding middle names that induce schoolgirl giggling. And to top it off, the teacher calls me Janet, because that is my official name. Derrida philosophically questions what's in a name. As a child, I practically questioned the seeming, seeming senselessness of lumbering a child with a name they are not called. But mum remained unreservedly unrepentant. Don't be silly, Jan. You were named after Nana and Ma, and you couldn't be named after two better folk. The female fetus develops the full set of egg cells she will have in her lifetime while she is in the womb. This plant plants a rather beautiful image of nesting Matryoshka dolls in my mind. I keep a set on my desk. In the winter spring of 19... 
23 during the aftergloom of the Great War, as Ma's pregnant belly swells with the fetus that will become Nana, the precursor cell of the egg that will become Mum is already inside Nana, who grows inside Ma. When it is Nana's turn for her pregnant belly to swell during the autumn winter of 1947, under the shadow of post-war austere Britain, the precursor cell of the egg that will become me is already inside Mum, who grows inside Nana. When it is Mum's turn for her pregnant belly to swell in the long, hot, mini-skirted summer of 1971, the precursor cell of the egg that will become the baby girl that I will give birth to 30 years later, who sits in a room <laughs> through there today, um, well, she was already nestled inside me as I grow inside Mum. Do you know, I remember asking my youngest, when I was pregnant with you, she tells me to stop. But I carry on regardless as I share my image of the nesting dolls. It starts a train of thought, so I continue. When I first felt you move, I say to her, my fingers feeling your first flutters through the stretching skin in my belly. It was the 11th of September, 2001. I was watching live television coverage of the Twin Towers and I was overwhelmed with love as I felt your quickening and I was so glad that you were safe and secure inside me. But I remember wondering what kind of world I was bringing my baby into. I suppose there have always been wars and I had money and security and a nice home and I was lucky and you were lucky too because you weren't ever going to have to go without. And now I wonder what it was like for Ma and Nana giving birth after wars with no money or security and... And my voice trails off as I falter for what to say next. I feel something, but I'm not sure what. Pain, shame, judgement, anger. I do not know, so I gloss over, to it, over it and continue chatting to my youngest. Anyway, well, I just thought you might want to know where you came from and... You come from me and Gran and Nana and Ma. You come from a long line of strong women. Next, Victoria Adokwe Bully. In her chapter, Is This Yours? Did you write this? Victoria wrote, By the time I was in late primary school, my parents were able to afford tutoring for me as a way of compensating for some of the lack of enthusiasm from teachers at my local state schools. Private tutoring may not typically be seen as a working class option, but just like my experience of being subject to low expectations in school, what it means to be or not be working class is inflected by being black in Britain. Even where two parents become professionals and are able to accumulate wealth, Originating from an immigrant background often entails the loss of family support networks and con connections, constituting a rupture in continuity which can persist through and impact upon generations of children raised here. In many ways, to be black is to be classed by default, resulting in a kind of lumping together of different kinds of otherness. But lived experience is more complicated than that. She includes two poems that give voice to her experiences of school and working life at the carefully managed intersections of gender, race and economics. Here she reads Clever Girl's Notes to Self. You know the answers but you wait a minute before raising your hand in class. You raise your hand to give the answer, often enough, but not too much. This is a careful balance, an active choice. You know you must remain a joy to teach, polite and always smiling in reports. You've been like this since age seven, year two. In year 12, when the class is none the wiser, Miss D looks to you for help. The essays you work all night on return headed with top marks. All the same, Miss D asks, in red biro ink, if the writing is yours. You raise your hand to give answers, often enough, but not too much. 
Enough to let her know you're smart. Just not enough to make her think that you already know you are. A high achiever, incredibly bright, capable, above average, homework always on time when due, exceptional, but still, Miss D likes it better when it looks like it's news to you. Next, Campania Banjoko, followed by Mina Rajput. Campania's chapter, Things You Wouldn't Say to Your Daughter, relates shocking experiences at school, ambivalent family relationships, and ways of overcoming. You heard in her film clip how she became an elective mute, and the fact that she is now a published performance poet. In her chapter, as she says in the film, she pays homage to the little girl that she was back then, afraid to speak, yet unaware of how her future would unfold. And one of the ways she has found her voice is through a poem entitled Speak. It is written as a villanelle, she says. I chose to imprison it within this form, to hold it tight and to make it restrictive in some sense, to represent how it felt to be inside my head, afraid to come out. I did not want the luxury of free verse and the ability to roam and wander. I also wanted a refrain to act as an affirmation to my five-year-old self. Don't worry, you will overcome this one day. Speak. Let not the tongue mourn silent in the night, nor let it hide in the grey storms that bray, for your words are as precious as the light. Should they try to devour you with spite, vultures who sit and pick upon decay, let not the tongue mourn silent in the night. They swoop and peck at flesh with much delight, crooked monsters who try to mute your say, but your words are as precious as the light. Take heart, the time will come for you despite the calls and claws that mark and maim your way. Let not the tongue mourn silent in the night. Hold fast, prepare your stance and flex for fight, and pave your way so you can speak one day, for your words are as precious as the light. Do not elect to keep your lips pressed tight, your tongue will soon become the sword to slay. Let it not mourn, but sing and pierce the night, for your words are as precious as the light. Mina Rajput's story tells how she failed to conform to traditional notions of what being clever as a young Indian girl entailed, failed to please her teachers who communicated highly confusing messages about whether she was clever or not, and how she succeeded in making her mother and extended family proud, despite following her very own path to fulfilment as a Greenpeace activist. Along the way, she encountered a number of significant figures whom she refers to as angels who catch her. I'm sitting on a bench in the lower school playground in the middle of a bitter icy winter. I'm wearing a stiff brown woolen parka. I struggle to pull the toggles through the loops. It makes me cry all alone on the bench. Little brown frozen fingers too cold to fasten my uncomfortable, uncomforting coat. The other kids are in their groups with their brown or golden hair, pale skin and rosy pink cheeks. I try to join in with them but Joanna Lee is calling me Pooh again and this stops the other girls from inviting me to play. Embarrassed and cast out, I go to find my brother to ask if I can play with him and his friends. He explains that they are on a spaceship saving the universe and that this is a boys game, not a girls game. I'm very sad and turn to go. Aaron pauses the intergalactic spaceship battle and gets into a huddle with his friends. He beckons me back and proudly announces that I am to be the tea lady on their spaceship. I'm not overjoyed, but I appreciate his effort and I need some friends so I follow him to my tea station, a brick wall. I am to face the wall and pretend to make tea while the boys resume their battle. 
I'm under strict instructions not to bring them tea while the battle is on. I'm only six or seven, but my own battle is starting. For the time being, however, I ditch the stupid tea lady role I've been assigned and I'm back on the bench, deflated and sat. Life is more fun and people are friendlier in my shop world. The dinner lady rings her bell to summon, summon us indoors for lunch. The school dinner kids, served by the plump, friendly, grey-haired dinner ladies and the pre-packed lunch kids, all run inside to eat together. I don't follow the others inside. I sit silently on my bench with my red, rainbow-bright lunchbox on my lap, my fingers freezing cold and tears slowly rolling down my face. My brother is heading in but stops and says he was delayed by the galactic battle. I wonder if he's been watching to see if I'm okay. He takes my hand and walks me to the dinner lady ringing the bell. Please miss, can you take care of my sister? She's crying because she's very cold. The dinner lady takes my hand, walks me to the canteen, past the queuing children who stare in bemusement. Through the lunch hall we go, straight into the big school kitchen. My superhero dinner lady asks the other ladies to open the large oven doors as she plops down a stool for me in front of it. Our little Mina is freezing cold and needs a bit of care. Let's get her warmed up. I'm in safe, welcoming, caring hands. I wipe my blurry eyes and smile. The other kids can piss right off. Sometime after that, our teacher, Mrs Rothwell, hears Joanna Lee calling me poo again. Joanna Lee sobs pathetically as she is scolded and moved to a different class, permanently. Her turn to be shamed. I somehow feel sorry for her, but I'm well chuffed with Mrs Rothwell, another superhero. Among the cruel ones who populate my childhood, there are angels who catch me. Finally, I'm reading for Claire Mitchell, one of the youngest of our contributors. This is an extract from her chapter, A Letter to My Younger Self, in which she tells of the struggle her mum had as a single parent, working towards a degree and taking young Claire with her to lectures. Claire's story of her own path through higher education offers a sharp contrast to the experiences of some of the older contributors from working class backgrounds who would never have got to university without fees paid for by the state and maintenance grants. This is the close of Claire's letter. Once you graduated, you thought you would find it easier to find a better job. You hadn't faced the realities of an increasingly competitive job market then, in which it is still difficult to get ahead when you have no money behind you. Good job that you didn't know, when you'd overcome that early loss of motivation, gained a sense of pride in the educational achievements your hard work had brought you, and were facing the world full of hope that you would find your opportunities limited once more. That you would find yourself applying for jobs close enough to home for you to afford the travel costs, taking jobs that allow you to pay the bills rather than the ones you dreamt of. Those jobs, it turns out, require more courses. They require you to undertake unpaid work. They require contacts that you don't have. Would you ever have imagined when you watched how hard mum worked waitressing to make ends meet and when you both survived on beans and toast for a summer that there would come a time when people with higher degrees would be expected to work for no money? That can't be true, you would have said. There's an expectation that you should be doing well now, an expectation that for a long time you shared since after all you had played your part and worked hard so the struggle should have paid off by now, right? Sadly, that's not the case. I hardly dare tell you that mum is in the same position, her dreams of using her skills to open her business shattered. Her degree didn't equate to money in the bank either. I can't help but ask myself, has any of it been worth it? We're older now and wiser, mum and I, but we still don't have the life we have been working so hard to obtain. What we do have is thousands of pounds of debt, more mountains to climb to reach security. I'm sorry to tell you, Claire, 
sitting there, oblivious, in your first lecture theatre, feeling content with your coloured pencils and paper, listening to those stories told by the man at the front. But the struggle goes on and on. With love and sorrow. Claire. There's both sorrow and love in all our stories. Sorrows as contributors reflected on whether and how they learnt to pass, or not. On the wider influences that shape us, on the struggles involved in dealing with a range of tribulations, from the discomforts and disorientation of being out of place or having the wrong kind of body, to the pains of covert and overt racism and on what the costs are of making the transitions involved in various kinds of migration. And love, in the form of figures our Greenpeace activist Mina referred to as guardian angels, figures who appear as rescuers at moments of crisis. Did we understand what we were negotiating at the time? Hardly. Perhaps this is why we story ourselves to impose some shape, some meaning, some sense of control and direction, attempting to shore up the fragments, as T.S. Eliot put it, creatively making it up as we go along. It involves what social anthropologist Tim Ingold refers to as reading creativity forwards, as an improvisatory joining in with formative processes. Processes that are not unfolding in a vacuum, of course. No woman is an island. A thread running through the collection is the idea that the auto in our autoethnographies is a relational self. Specifically, it traces how subjectivities are formed in relation to what sociologist Bev Skeggs calls oppressive hierarchies of personhood, making our stories contributions to what Rose O'Neill and Keto Kivi call ontologies of relationality. As Alison Phipps said, when authors assemble remembered fragments from their pasts, they are doing so to enable a certain telling of a certain story. The stories we have told in the book illustrate some of the ways in which social relations are organised according to classed, gendered and racialized regimes of value and economies of personhood. When we'd finished them, we shared them with each other, read them all, and then shared our responses to them. The email-enabled conversation that resulted forms the penultimate chapter of the book. I wrote, As I type, I am filled with a feeling of joy, sharing this space with so many amazing women. Yes, that's what I'm feeling, it's joy. Thank you all for trusting me with your stories. That's so much to write about, reading our lived experiences, Jan's resounding declaration of giving voice to silenced women who have earned their place in our my stories, Melanie's acknowledgement of our heritage and Pania's recognition that our being clever may simply be our soul work resonated with me. I recognise the strength of all your characters and qualities that concurs with my values, such as Mosabi's daring to look in the mirror and ask questions as she has been told not to ask. And through this shake off what is not hers, I like the music we're making and I want to dance. Sarah Ward is another contributor. Her response began like this. It's such a treat to be able to share reflections on these wonderful chapters before we all get tidied and formalised into a book. I imagine us still whispering to each other between the pages, even once we're typeset and bound on a shelf. Settle down, girls. Stand up straight. You're in a library now. And I observed reading all of your pieces has been like being let loose in the most wonderful library, where, as in all libraries, you find echoes of yourself alongside thoughts and ideas and experiences you might never otherwise have encountered. 
and I'm much richer for it. I loved the nuance and detail of all the pieces. Each one felt like being invited in and guided around the inside of so many experiences, mapping them out. Look, hear the sore places. Here though, look at what I did, what I made, who I've become. And now, look at what we are all doing here together in this collection. I think what we have produced here is utterly amazing. I felt so trusted in reading these pieces. I've been in tears. I felt viscerally shocked, sadly not in a surprised way. I've laughed, learned, remembered, felt empathy and connection around big things and small. There was a point though where I got scared. I experienced some of the fear and overwhelm I'd felt trying to write my piece in the first place that my piece won't measure up malarkey. And then I let myself just purely enjoy and learn from what I was reading. And I let the utter trust and generosity that shines out from these pieces hold me. And I dared to read my own piece alongside everyone else's. And I thought, it's okay, it deserves to be here. So thank you for everything that this amazing reading experience has given me. Angels all. Even now, as an undeniably middle-class white person, I still marvel when I see them, those walking, talking, unquestioning embodiments of entitlement. I don't envy them their willful ignorance of the lived experience of others who have fewer opportunities, who have acquired what Irving Goffman calls spoiled identities through the workings of stigma as a classificatory form of power, or who have constantly to negotiate various forms of discrimination. But I sometimes envy that way of moving through the world with consummate ease that arises from a privileged background. It takes some of us almost a lifetime to achieve something similar. Not the same, since one can never not know what one knows in and under and through the skin. Still, a little of that being at ease is what I wished for in relation to this collection. That it would become a space where we could meet each other and readers as our ordinary, as opposed to exotic, exceptional or in some way othered selves. Where we would come to feel more composed and more intelligible to ourselves and to readers seeking to celebrate their own ordinariness as clever girls and boys, at least for the time being. Tracy, a contributor who wrote about self-harm, reminded us that endings are as arbitrary as beginnings, but with this crucial difference. All the beginnings that might exist are already there, back down the track, somewhere to be found if only you can follow the threads far enough. The possible endings, on the other hand, if not infinite, are numberless and cannot be glimpsed with certainty. The future is open. Her message was, I think, intended to be a hopeful one. Now, in this time of multiple crises, the idea that endings cannot be glimpsed with certainty is infused with a rather different feeling. Still, if we reflect on the theme of this conference, reclamation, and if we pick up on Barker and Buchanan Barker's definition of it as making something new from what is salvaged from wreckage, we may be able to restore a sense of hopefulness for the future, including that it could hold possibilities for a radical reform of classed, gendered and racialised inequalities. <laughs>